This is the Horse Radio Network. This is episode 552 of the Dressage Radio Show, official podcast of the United States Dressage Federation on the Horse Radio Network, brought to you by Kentucky Performance Products and Total Saddle Fit. On today's show, we are going to have a discussion with longtime friend of the show, Hillary Moore Hebert, about career planning for your horses. After that, we're going to bring you a couple of trainer tips that we pre-recorded with Emily Donaldson and Megan Davis. This is Reese Koffler Stanfield from Loxahatchee, Florida. And this is Philip Parks from Rockwood, Ontario, and you're listening to the Dressage Radio Show. Hi, Phil. Hi, Reese. What have you been up to? Oh, my gosh. We've been riding our little tails off down here. I'm not going to lie. We've been really, really busy. We've got a horse show tomorrow. I've got a horse show again next week. So we are in full swing, which is pretty fun and cool. So all is well, for sure. Yeah. Nice, How about nice. You? I know. How well, about you? I, you know, returned back to the yeah. frigid north and, you know, not super happy about it. But I know. as the month turns over from January to February, it's sort of like mentally that that's a big hurdle for me. Yeah, yeah. It's sort of like, OK, we're we're halfway through the winter or at least halfway through the winter. You know, it's, I can I can do this. And, I, you know, yeah. I've got a couple of things planned that, you know, Meredith and I are going away at the end of the month and this and that. So th- there's there's some cool stuff that I'm looking forward to in the near future and actually trying to get my students together for planning for the summer and the, the show prize lists are out. Like, you know, I know all the dates, so we're kind of planning that. And yeah, there's a little bit of inspiration going on. That's what I want to say. Awesome. So like, I love oh, it. Every day it's cold and every day the snow is falling <laughs> off the roof and, the, you know. Yeah, it's it's like yeah. we're halfway done. It's like uphill from here. Well, yeah, and well, it's it's going downhill from here. Okay, sorry, downhill. Sorry, <laughs> sorry. I was uh, being positive. And the days are getting a bit longer, and all these things. These are all you know plus things that are, that are helping me keep my oh. motivation to keep going. Yeah. So that's I what it's all about. It. That's what it's all about. That is what it is all about. We love it. We love it. Well, we've got another little inspiration, don't we, Phil? We got we have our book club book. From Trafalgar Square, we have our yeah. announcement. I know we have Did been delaying this roll? announcement. Should we do um, a drum roll? Dun, dun, dun. Okay, you can do the drum. Tell, tell us what the book is. Okay, the book is Four Legs Move My Soul, an authorized biography of Dressage Olympian Isabel Vert. Dun, dun, dun. Yeah, we, and we it were is really ex- excited about getting this book. Yeah, and I wrote it wish already. We could be telling you that we're bringing Isabel on the show, but. The schedule uh, <laughs> has been so difficult, you know, yeah, that's, that's one so of our dreams, you know, to have, to have a writer like Isabel uh, on our, on our podcast. We're going to keep working on it. Maybe yep. we'll see her at world cup and, and sort of somehow make her come on our show, but <laughs> we're really, really lucky to have this book and yeah, I, I'm really, really look, cool. looking forward. I, I'm already a couple chapters into it. So I finished it. Uh, I mean, I, I sat down and I like, couldn't put it down. So I'm really excited that, that everybody gets to read it and we'll have a fun discussion on it. So again, Four Legs, Move My Soul, the authorized biography of dressage Olympian Isabel Vert. And it is available at Trafalgar Square, which is fantastic, which is www.horseandriderbooks.com. It's great. And we appreciate all that Trafalgar Square does for us. And uh, we're excited to bring this book to you. So we're going to announce it and then we'll probably review it and we'll get an auditor. So auditors get ready. We'll pick an auditor and then we'll have that auditor come on the show here in a few weeks. And we hope everyone enjoys it. And it gives that inspiration that it gave to me. I mean, reread it. It was that good. So I look forward to sharing that with everybody. And Fantastic. We, we've got yeah. more inspiration. We've got lots of fun, fun guests. And why don't we get started with Hillary Moore Hebert? She's back on the show and we hope you enjoy our discussion together. Well, tonight I am so excited to have back on the show. She was a regular for so long and now she's back. Hillary Moore Hebert. Hillary, welcome back to the show. Hi guys. I'm very excited to talk to you. I know we've missed you. We did I have miss been you. Very busy. Yeah, I although you guys are saying like the show has missed me because I saw you guys in person recently because we've all been enjoying the warm weather of Wellington, Florida together. So 
That is very true. That is very true. I have seen you, Phil has seen you, but we're excited you're back on the show for sure. How have you yes, been? What have you been up to? I have been very good. We have all of the horses down here for season and just doing tons of stuff. It's been actually really fun because when I think about when I saw you guys, you know, we're going over the horse show, getting to see a lot of the team riders, getting ready to try to qualify for the Olympics and World Cup. And then we went over to see like a open house with people's very, very fancy sale horses. And so it's all been very inspiring to see both the quality of riding, but also, um, you know, the quality of horses coming up. And I, I, it has been fantastic. And also it's nice that the weather is perfect. It, it that d- never hurts, does it? That the weather's quite nice and we've been able to ride yeah. and all the good stuff. It, it's amazing. And, and yeah, f- season is in full swing now. So there, there are literally our shows all the time and clinics and things going on for sure. And it's, it's really a fun time down here right now for sure. So yeah. we are, we are happy that you're here. So what are we talking about today? So speaking of, you know, the riders who are trying to qualify for some things and, you know, also seeing the sale horses, I thought it would be an interesting topic to talk about, you know, how to plan, really, I guess the way I'd summarize it is how to plan around your horse that you have now, assuming most amateurs, you know, you're not going to have a string of 15 horses, how to plan around your horse's career with the reality that you're going to, your career is going to most likely extend past that. And what do you do in terms of deciding when your horse is, Um, topping out of the level that they're at versus, you know, when to keep progressing. And so I think to me, it's one of those things where I think it's the most difficult, very complex question in this industry. And it's really what drives people, you know, showing and selling and on and on and on is kind of trying to pursue the new thing. And how do you match that with your current horse versus deciding that, you know, you may need to do something else. Yeah, no, I, I mean, I think, I think we all deal with that as professional riders and, and trying to advise students on when it's time to move up and when it's time to stay with where you are. And, and I think it, in a lot of ways, it has to be a team effort with your entire team, I think. And, and I also think it, you have to be pretty realistic with what your horse's capabilities are, not being barn blind, because it's really hard to not be barn blind. Um, I have you guys to make sure I'm not barn blind. Thank you all. Um, but I think that's really important to, to be realistic about sort of what your horse's niche is and what they're good at. And when have you surpassed your horse? And that does happen a lot. What do you think, Phil? It's a really interesting and also difficult topic because our horses are our friends and, you know, we, spend at least a few years developing the partnership and relationship and it, it you know there there are horses and they help us in our you know achieve our sports goals but they also help us achieve you know as a pet you know our goals and our uh, of having a companionship and sort of those two things don't always go together um well, I have- I have a question specifically for you, actually, because I figured as I was thinking about this topic chronologically, I have a friend who had a young horse that she got with a to be a dressage prospect. And I, as a lot of your listeners will know, have some two and a half year old, you know, yearling coming up. And as what I consider sort of our resident young horse expert, when or what are the signs you find? for young horses that tell you most commonly that they're not probably in the vocation. Maybe someone's bought a horse thinking, oh, I want to do, you know, dressage with it and they have a youngster. What are some of the things you can start to tell that maybe they have other careers in mind? That again is another really tough question. Mm -hmm. Um, It depends. If, if someone's bought a horse and it's a very, you know, if it's a fancy young horse, and I think your yours are, and you say, well, I want to do, I want to eventually do the FEI levels with it. So, St. Okay. George, uh, you know, I won sort of as as the base minimum. I think you can sort of tell whether they like dressage when they're about six or seven years old. That's interesting. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. That's sort of. So you can, uh, what, what I recommend is cross training, uh-huh. you know, until that point and then, and then evaluating whether you've, you've got a dressage horse or a good all round horse or possibly like, I'm not an expert jumper or eventer or anything in those worlds, but you can, I think you can sort of tell what they like doing by about mm-hmm. that point. But I think it's really, you really should not be special specializing strictly your horse's training until a little bit later in life and holding off and, and in doing, doing it more, you know, more things with your horse that, that at that point, if, if you do decide that their career is better off in another field that they've they already got, got a start yeah, and a base yeah, yeah. and that you can, you yeah. can specialize them from that point on. So I, I think, think that's a long with, time when you've got a horse from two years old and then you put, you know, you've got to put, uh, at least three years training or, or two years training. So yeah, I'm well, not in this for the long haul. But yeah. What I think it's really interesting about that. You saying that is literally just today. I was, um, talking to someone who has a mare that I think she's probably five. And they said, you know, she's gotten to be a bit contrary and which is so surprising to us because she was the easiest one to start. And, she was so agreeable as a youngster. So it's really interesting that you're talking about that because I have noticed that just anecdotally, and I love mares. Like, I have done very well with them, so I'm not an anti-mare person at all. But I also do notice that with the mares, as they kind of settle into their hormones and everything, you know, you can have one horse as a young horse, and I have had an experience of clients buying horses and you know I said to them you have to be careful with the young horses sometimes as you said you're just it's a prospect and sometimes as you were saying as they get a bit older their temperaments change and they may not be the same horse that you bought oh absolutely Mm -hmm. I I mean there isn't a a six-year-old that I've ridden you know from three to six or whatever that hasn't changed their personality in some way or another oh that's interesting that's Absolutely. I mean, they, they are very, they can be very, very agreeable, agreeable at three years old because they are still babies. They're very mentally immature. And, and then as they age a couple more years and they start to feel their bodies and then they start to, I think it's, I think it's like teenage children, you know, they start to test their limits sometimes and they start, you know, Toddler. not a hundred percent of the horses, yeah. but they, they will. No, so, but I think that they're testing their boundaries, you know, and, and that kind of thing. And, you know, yeah, that's that why. Total sense. Yeah. yeah. That's why. But I, I think, too, I, Phil, don't you think, too, like, you know, I get them more when they're they're a little bit older and then they, the oh, same thing happens when they go to FEI horses or from third, fourth level. Same thing. Like, sometimes they can change their personality and sometimes it's good and sometimes it's like, well, I don't think I want to work that hard. So I found that also is a time that, you know, again, there's a big difference between, you know, a third, fourth level horse. There's a big difference between a pre St. George I one horse and there's a big difference between an I two and a Grand Prix horse. And sort of within all of those different categories, right? That's a time where I think you also have to be pretty realistic, right? Like, it, you know, I, I, I have a horse in training now. It's a lovely team. It's a lovely partnership. Her goal is a silver medal and maybe inter one. And she said, what do you think about Grand Prix? And I was like, mm, probably not on this horse. And and you, I think you have to be realistic about that, right? Like he's already 14. He Getting to the inter one will be a big step for him, you know, and that's another year away. So he's 15, 16. And then trying to put the Grand Prix on him is, is probably not going to happen. Maybe, but. Mm. Well, and I think that it's important to insert, and I mean this in a very kind way because I am including myself in this, having, you know, done the free St. George for decades now. I think the question, too, is when you say a horse has gotten to pre St. George, are you talking about like my pre St. George I did in 2000 that was a horse? going through the motions or are you talking about in you know the much more rare case a pre-saint torch that's going to get you a medal you know well it used to not with the change but like can end games you know i'm saying where then you have a horse who's really on the cusp of kind of doing more and i think that 
that also is an important point to consider because there's a lot of levels that you can get yourself through to get your scores, but you are missing pieces that's going to make it possible to move up. And that doesn't make those horses bad. It's just that they maybe are tolerant of doing a 65% third level, but to get them, you know, packaged up into a way that's good for a 70% pre-St. George is just very far off from where you are. Yeah. Well, yeah, well, I mean, that's true. Yeah. That's true. You know, saying I want to go to nationals, right? Do you want to do third level? Do you want to go to third level nationals? I mean, you know, there's all different yeah. levels of horses, and that depends on the on the thing on on your horse and in your level. Or do you want to go well, to nationals and, and, and your you sport know? goals? Yeah, right. your sport goals. I mean, yeah, we can say you know you can certainly put a, a few years on like say say you have a third level horse that you've taken until like you've had the horse a few years. You've taken it to third level. It's doing a good job, but it's not a 70% third level. You can, you know, spend an, another couple of years riding the same horse, but you may may not be able to put another three years in, and it may not go go up to pre St. George. I mean, yeah, yeah. Let's, let's be realistic. But you you might be able to get a few more percent out of out of the third level horse and ride it, you know, maybe fourth level, and, and but not for a 65% of fourth level, and then you know, like yeah. like what are your goals? Be realistic. And then let's let's talk about what to do with that horse now. So right, yeah, it's maybe 13 years old, does a nice right. third level. What are your options? Like, do you do you have to sell it? Right. Yeah. Right. And I think that you know you were softer about it. I think as I get older and go through my own horses and have to be retired, I'm very lucky to have a farm. But I think that when you have a horse who's 14 or 15. You must think about what the heck the plan is. Because I see people dilly dallying around. Suddenly they have a 17 year old horse. Suddenly they have a 19 year old horse. And I know people who have retired horses at 18 that are 37 years old and they have been paying for 19 years of retirement, which is approximately, when I did the math, 100 thousand dollars because they didn't find a nice junior rider who has you know like a backyard barn that could trailer and for five grand just give them the horse because to them it's like well this is a you know horse that can do fourth level and they overvalue their horse and before they know it they're spending a fortune because of that yeah no i think that that's you know i I, i'm the same i also yeah. I also own a farm, but I don't, you know, you got to, and, and there's some horses that I'm like, okay, I, I, you know, this horse was amazing and, and I'm going to retire them and I have that responsibility. Yeah. But, you know, again, you have to take that responsibility, right? You've got to know that's coming. And, you know, I, I also think this is really important. I mean, I, like I said, I'm very lucky that I have you guys and for sure, Phil to crush my dreams when he, <laughs> but I ask him, <laughs> Phil's amazing. Cause I, I ask him like, should I sell this one? Should I keep it? And he knows the whole story and he crushes my dreams and says, come on, sell it or keep it or whatever. And I think that, no, no, again, no. If that's you're important. asking, should I sell the horse? I think nine to ten times out of ten, the answer is yes. Probably. Yeah. Probably. Yeah. No. And I, well, it's, I mean, it's, so different, well, it's different because it, it I, I mean, as professionals, we're in the sales business, you know, right. so we have to we have to like. But, value another year's worth of training or, you know, where yeah. Yeah. the horse may be. And, and I mean, this is not talking about, you know, people's own personal horse, but, but I think that people should think about these things, yeah. plan for them. And, and possibly even if they don't sell it, they could find a really nice person to lease the horse to. Yes. Yeah. But I think, right? and that's my, I totally agree. And maybe I miscommunicated. I think if you're thinking, oh, I should lease the horse, absolutely. But if you're asking the question realistically to someone else, do you think I should sell this horse? I think that you probably should. Do you get what I'm saying? Where yeah. your first solution is I can lease yes. the horse. But if you're getting to a point where you're like, well, I'm not really coming out to the barn that often. and It's costing me a lot of money. What do you think I should do with such a nice horse? If you're starting to ask people, what do you think, should I sell it? I think that mostly that's a sign you're ready to do it. And you should probably pull the trigger before they get some reason that they can't be sold. Because I see people sitting on that 
until the horses are, you know, unmarketable and they wish they'd done it sooner. Yeah. yeah. No, uh, it's, it's, it's a good point. I mean, it's, it's so hard because they, we can't take them home with us and, 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 you know, they cost money and, and if, if, if you can't afford two horses, what do you do? And, 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 and these sort of, sort of issues and problems. I mean, I've retired horses, ones that, you know, I had to say, well, you don't owe me anything. I, you know, I don't want to sell yeah. you. And, but, but I've, I've tried to find economical solutions for those horses, you know, yeah. situations in which they may be, I might be able to, to rent a stall at a barn where, or not a stall, just a, a turnout situation where they spend their, you know, spend their time. Yeah. And like with Reese where, you know, she has a barn and could theoretically give lessons on the horse. And that's yeah. where I think if your first reaction is yeah. I'm really committed to this horse yeah. and I can make it work, you know, also I think you should be true to yourself with that and say, even if people are pressuring me to sell them, if my first reaction is to ask people, how can I keep him? I think again, nine to 10 times out of 10, you should probably keep him and find a way to make that work because as you said, we're responsible for them. And I'm not going to be sort of that person who says, you know, this is just a money-making endeavor. I have horses that I have kept for, you know, life um, because I feel a responsibility to that. And I'm, you know, I think that's also something, like you said, that's really important to this whole thing is you shouldn't be, you know, just sending them off to a sale barn because you're trying to get them off the payroll as fast as possible. Yeah. Yeah, no, I think it's good. Well, I think this is such a cool conversation. And, and again, if anybody has any questions or needs some advice from the uh, the panel here, we are thrilled to always do it. And Hillary, we're glad, so, so glad you're back here on the show. And, and if our listeners have any more questions for you, how can they find you online? The best thing to do, actually, is if they want to check, they can message me on Facebook, just under Hillary Moore Hebert. Or you can go to moredressage.com, which is my maiden name, M-O-O-R-E. And, or you can just bug Reese and Philip. <laughs> yeah. You can just ask yeah. my secretaries and send me questions. <laughs> that sounds amazing. We love it. Well, Hillary, thanks so much as always. And we look forward to having you back on the show more often. Okay. Have a great night. Well, we're going to have a quick break for with Kentucky Performance Products. And after that, we're coming back with some trainer tips with Megan Davis. We're going to start with her. She had waited all her life for this moment, dreaming about it since she was 10 years old. The trailer ramp touched the ground. He whinnied as she backed him out, swinging his head around to get a good look at his new home. His coat gleamed in the sun. Her love had arrived. She was breathless. He was beautiful. She could hardly wait to tack him up and start off on what she was sure would be the best times of her life. This love story is brought to you by Contribute, providing essential omega-3 fatty acids that help maintain low inflammation levels throughout your horse's body. The horse that matters to you matters to Kentucky Performance Products. Call 859-873-2974 or visit kppusa.com to order today. Well, for this week's Total Saddle Fit Tip of the Week, we are thrilled to have Megan Davis of Megan Davis Dressage back on the show. Welcome. Hi, how are you guys? We are great. So Megan, what is your trainer tip of the week for us? Well, mine's more of how to interview a possible working student. Something I've found in the past that works really well is when you're talking, going over their goals, going over your goals for them for the summer is to hand them some unrolled polos and to ask them to re-roll them. If they do what I call the perfect polo, they wrap it nice and tightly and it's eared in so it doesn't come off, come unrolled, then they're going to work super hard for you and they obviously care about the job that they're going to do. If it's loose, they don't seem to care, it's you know uneven on top or, the, or it's not dog eared in, you have some trouble on your hands. <laughs> I love it. No, I mean, this got us chatting. We were talking right before we got on the show and you know, it's true. Like, so when I interview someone uh, for a job, I actually put some garbage on the, on the ground, kind of like where we're going to be walking by. And I see if someone picks it up. That's what I do because it's the same thing. That's that's a good idea too. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, it's the same concept, right? Like I have a small barn 
everybody has to pitch in, everybody has to do it. And, you know, if you walk by a piece of garbage, like that means I'm the only one to pick it up, which of course I will because I own the property, but you know, it, it, it's just a sign of like the person, you know, you know the inner person. And, and, you know, I think we all, and I know everybody on this call was a working student. And I believe very, very much in that program. I, I believe that's how you learn in horses, but I also believe in contracts. I think they're really important that everybody is clear on, on what each party is doing, but we all also run small barns, right? And, and in a barn. Yeah. I mean, everybody has to, if you're, if you're standing around, we got a problem, right? Yeah. I think it's tough as a boss to kind of, you have an expectation for, for what, an employee should do or, or, you know, but just in how they are. And and like you said, attention to detail and not having to be directed to, to do every little single little thing. Um, you know, if you're keen, go the extra mile. And especially if you're being, if you're being interviewed or, you know, pay attention to those details. And and then, you know, I think it just makes the relationship work all that much better. I, I know that, you know, Uh, We were just talking, uh, you know, on this subject and, you know, like as an employer or as the boss, you're going to go that extra mile for a person who is going to do the little extra things. Right. And, and, you know, it it works both ways. Right. And then, and then if you are in a situation where you feel like you're, you're going the extra mile, but you're not getting it back from your employer, then there also needs to be a conversation that happens. But you know, I think just because we've been through, been working students, we we know what it's like. So we're, you know, pretty sympathetic for somebody who is, is working extra hard and doing the little extra things. And, and uh, uh, you know, we're more more than willing to give back. But, you know, not not if, if, if you have to be directed to, okay, the barn aisle is, is dirty or, you know, go and sweep it. You know, don't be on, don't be on Facebook all day and, and that kind of thing. So, yeah, I, I always, I always say to my uh, working students, I'll never ask them to do a job I wouldn't do myself. And the harder they work, the more they get to ride. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. It's so true. Yeah. And I mean, that's, that's the deal, right? And at the end of the day, you know, these jobs have to get done. They have to get done when we're here. They have to get done in Kentucky. Yep. Like they have to get done. And the quicker you do them and the, and the more, like you said, attention to detail to those jobs, the better. And, and it's, your barn looks great and, and it, it's really fantastic. So I love it. Any other tips for someone interviewing for a working student position? Never sit idle. Always have your, always be busy and be honest. Be honest with what you are expecting out of the job. If you expect to be showing FBI by the end of the summer, say that to your tra- to your potential employer and they may say, hey, listen, I don't have that horse for you. And you know, if you really want to push that far and you work hard, maybe I can help you with that. But don't set unrealistic goals either. I think that's actually really good. And and the idea of, you know, there are sometimes that people just can't help you. Like they won't yeah. they won't have the horses or they won't have access to the horses or they're riding the horses. So it's not like maybe somebody would like to help you, but they don't have the horses. So uh, I think that's really important. I think that's really good. Realistic goals for everybody in the budget and all that kind of stuff. I think that's really important. Yes. And, and it just keeps everybody honest. And I think everybody feels like they're getting their share. It's, you know, nobody's feeling left out that way. Yeah. I love it. Well, Megan, thank you so much for your trainer tip. And how can our listeners find you online? My website is megandavisdressage.com. I'm on Facebook. I'm on Instagram. Find me there. (laughs) Fantastic. I love it. Thanks so much. And we look forward to talking with you soon. Thank you. Bye-bye. Well, Phil, we we have a great picture because we got a box from Justin from Total Saddle Fit when you and Glenn were down here. And um, yeah, we, we had gotten some questions for a lot of people. What's the difference between the slim stability stirrup leathers or, and the original stability stirrup leathers. So you've seen them. I've seen them and ridden in them. What did you think, Phil? I, I think it's fantastic. The uh, what it, you know the the new version eliminates more of the bulk of the stirrup leather because the buckle is put on the bottom more where the stirrup hangs rather than up under your leg. And I think you know this is uh, it's not the first time I've seen this, but 
it's a, I think it's a great idea if you're trying to eliminate even more, you know, if, if your, your thigh is pressing against the buckle, I mean, it's, it's more bulk. So let me know how, how, how are they riding? Yeah, they ride great. And actually, I may, Karen Isberg has stolen them. And Karen, as everybody knows, she comes on the show and rides Oreo and, and is Kentucky Performance Products. And she, she used them and she loves them. And I thought it was really interesting for her because she is a very tiny lady with really long legs. And she loves them because she doesn't, it took away the bulk underneath her thigh. So for her, it's even more comfortable. So I thought that that was really an interesting, I have really long legs and juicy thighs. So, it, you know, to me, you know, and I've always ridden with them like that. So, it, so for her though, I didn't really think about it, but for her, it took away that bulk and it's so much more comfortable for her. So I thought that was really interesting and not something I would have thought of, but she loves them. She literally was like, I'm not giving them back. <laughs> and I, was like, uh, I need them back. Okay. Well, you're going <laughs> to have to buy stolen them. Sure if you want another pair, maybe, I don't know. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So I thought it was really cute, but so she, she loves them. So I think take a look at them, kind of take the feedback. Philip and I are always happy to help with the feedback and picking which one you like, or uh, also Justin at Total Saddle Fit's amazing and he will completely help you with all your purchases. So that's totalsaddlefit.com. Take a look at them. But Phil, we also have a great Total Saddle Fit tip of the week with Emily Donaldson and we hope everyone enjoys it. This week's dressage training tip is brought to you by Total Saddle Fit, home of the shoulder relief girth at totalsaddlefit.com. Well, for this week's Total Saddle Fit tip of the week, we are so happy to have Emily Craig Donaldson. She's FEI rider and trainer on the show. Emily, welcome back. So, Emily, you have a great tip of the week for us, don't you? I do. So, an exercise that I actually learned when I was riding in a clinic with George Williams last year is something that I've used a fair bit um, with horses that I ride myself as well as some students' horses. And so it's for horses that maybe you're doing a uh, trot lengthening or even a medium or extended trot, and they tend to run a little bit to the rider, get on the forehand, maybe have rhythm issues, they get out of balance, is I find instead of halting a horse and just halting, is sometimes it's benefit to turn the forehand. I think sometimes moving a horse off of the leg in a sideways motion is more effective than just halting because I think when you halt, you might get too busy with your hand and the horse might get more behind the leg. So what I do is I'll be trotting, go across the diagonal, it can be a short diagonal, but I trot across the diagonal like a normal medium trot and then I bring the horse to walk or halt depending on the horse, and I ask them to do it from the forehand. And usually it's off of, so if you're doing a diagonal, it's probably going to be off of the outside leg. And then you are um, back on the line facing the direction you came from. You do another medium trot, and you bring the horse back, and then do another turn of the forehand. If, you're, if you feel like the horse is falling on one leg in particular, um, you probably don't want to do the medium all the way in, into the perimeter of the ring. So you give yourself some room um, if you're up against the wall to move off of the legs that they're falling into. And so I find it's an exercise that you can repeat uh, several times. And you'll find that the horse starts to become a little bit more responsive to the half halt and a little bit more on the rider's feet. And, and in turn, your your medium trot improves. And it's an, I think the turn of forehand is a little bit of a a lost exercise because it's not, it's not in any test. Um, and it's something like you do with your baby horse when you're breaking it, but it's easy to forget, you know, the use it has for a more mature horse. So, I mean, it, even, even in the walk, I think sometimes I'll, I'll walk horses on the short side and I'll do it on the front off of my short side as well, just so that they understand the principle of the movement. And then you can apply it to your medium trot exercise. Yeah. No, I mean, I love it. And I'm with you. I think it's a very underutilized exercise. I teach it a ton. I use it a lot. Another application that I've used, I've actually used it for working on flying changes or, or going toward. I'll go on the short diagonal and if a horse gets, you know, do a canter walk transition and then I'll ride a turn on the forehand and then yeah. pick up maybe the new lead. And that's a great exercise as well. It's the same kind of thing. It's just kind of 
moving them and bending them. And yeah, I've had really yeah, good luck. Yeah, you have the half pot on the outside. Mm-hmm. And so it's that, that diagonal connection. I think so many people think about, like, I can't tell you many times I've said, do a turn on the forehand and someone does a turn on the haunches. And I'm like, yeah. no, that's not it. And they go, well, what is a turn on the forehand? And I'm <laughs> like, wait, what? You don't what? Know what yeah. That is? <laughs> it's almost so early in the, in the band roll that people forget, you know, it's like, no, right. no, no, this is a super important exercise. Right. Sure. Right. So I, I, yeah, I think, I think this, whole, this lends itself nicely. I mean, when it, when it becomes appropriate, I do do the, the extensions or the lengthenings into a turn, a turn on the haunches or, you know, a pirouette. Yeah. Uh, the idea yeah. here is not just to jam on the brakes because that can make everything a, a lot worse, even especially if the horse sort of, anticipates in the corner that you're going to bring them back, but they bring them, they bring themselves back in a bad, like more on the forehand and start slamming their feet into the ground. Right. I think this is all about just keeping, keeping the legs busy and teaching the riders to keep the leg on when, when they want to come back. Right. Because the more that you can do that, the more you're, you're not just putting them on the brakes, but getting the horse better balanced and more capable coming back and, and starting the idea of, of collection. And, and, you know, you can't do that if you aren't pushing on the horse a little bit or, you know, moving the legs a little bit. So yeah, I really, I really like this exercise. I really, I really like that you, uh, that you brought it, brought it to our listeners today. Great. Thank you. And Emily, how can our listeners find you online? I have a website, which isn't always up to date, but it's up to date enough it's Emily Donaldson Dressage. I, I think it's Emily Donaldson Dressage.com. And then even better, I have a pretty strong Facebook presence under my business name and Instagram as well. Um, and then my email, which is I get 24 seven is Emily Donaldson Dressage at gmail.com. Fantastic. Well, Emily, thanks so much. And we look forward and to, to talking with you soon. Great. Thank you. Well, everybody, Phil and I really, really love email and Facebook shout outs. We love seeing you at the horse shows and out and about. Please always say hi to us. Seriously, we love it. And we'd love to hear if you, you have a question. We are uh, always yeah, or, any, or, or any, just any. Anything. Um, We're around. Anything. Yeah. You know, tell us <laughs> what you like about the show. Especially tell us what you don't like about the show. Yeah. I mean, we can take a little criticism. That we can, we can. Hurt my feelings. At yeah. this point, we can. After seven and a half years, we're good. <laughs> we can. We've heard it all. <laughs> no, we, we're happy to. We, we love it and we want to help as much as we can. So please feel free to reach out. And as always, you can find our show notes and links to today's guests on our website, dressageradio.com. Like us on Facebook, just search Dressage Radio Show. Follow us on Twitter at Horse Radio. My website is maplecrestfarmky.com and my email is reese at horseradionetwork.com. I think the best way to find me is on Facebook. You can send me a message or email at philip at horseradionetwork.com. I'd like to thank our sponsors for allowing us to put on a show. And don't forget to check out all the other shows on the Horse Radio Network at horseradionetwork.com. Everybody, keep your heels down and your shoulders back, and we will talk to you next week. <laughs>